All right. Thank you very much, Scott, for agreeing to give a build a cell seminar, and you can get started. Yeah, thank you, Kate. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you again. Kate and I ran into each other at uh, a, a, an NSF-sponsored workshop in the Netherlands over the summer. It was really exciting to hear about her research. Um, if anybody just wants to jump in at any point, please do. Uh, I'm also going to pause maybe halfway through and see if anyone has any questions. So just as an introduction, I, I'm trained in molecular cell biology and biochemistry. Uh, thinking about how to build a cell for me started back when I was earning my PhD at, at um, UCSF, where I was working in the lab of Dyke Mullins, which is where I uh, earned my PhD. Sorry, I'm just learning how to navigate the controls here, um, which is not working the way I expected. We can see your pointer. Yeah, the, the slide navigation is not working right here. Let's try this again. Okay. So uh, basically, when I started my PhD, uh, Wendell Lim had gotten a center grant, which was funded by the NIH for nanomedicine. And the goal of that was to try to design cells that have new emergent properties. So this led to a lot of synthetic biology that you've probably seen in his lab. And we, we would have really great discussions about how to, like, design GUVs to have, uh, you know, cell-like properties. So that, that idea uh, in terms of how I think about science has stuck with me for uh, nearly two decades now. So in my lab, which is at the University of Oregon, um, we are studying the mechanisms by which cells sense chemicals in their environment and the, the signal processing that happens at the plasma membrane immediately after receptors are activated. And we primarily use human neutrophils as a model system. Uh, this movie to the right is from Oliver Holler, which is looking at uh, dictostelium chemotaxis. And uh, human neutrophils and other white blood cells chemotax in a very similar way. So cell migration is really critical for lots of processes, including development and tissue homeostasis. If you have an injury or there's pathogens, you know, white blood cells, which are marked here in green, are going to migrate towards those sites and try to, to neutralize those pathogens and clear them out. Uh, this is obviously a very dynamic process, and you can look at it from different angles. So my PhD was looking at the mechanisms that control actin cytoskeleton tethering to the plasma membrane. Uh, the actin cytoskeleton is responsible for all these membrane morphological changes that you're familiar with. So we tend to look at the dynamics of these processes uh, using methods like turf microscopy. Uh, this movie I'm going to show you is, is, a, is from a paper that Orion Weiner published uh, when I was a first year graduate student that is probably the most inspirational, paper, uh, inspirational movie that I've seen. So what you're looking at here is a white blood cell. And it, the fluorescent marker is a, a marker of actin nucleation. This cell is going to be stimulated with a bacterial peptide, and you're going to see that it globally lights up. So every receptor on the membrane is getting activated, and then the cell breaks symmetry and it starts to polarize in one direction. The things that my lab is trying to understand are what are the positive and negative feedback loops that are orchestrated on the plasma membrane that allow systems like this to break symmetry or, or self-organize. And the two classes of molecules that we primarily focus on are PIP lipids and their associated uh, kinases and phosphatases, which control the interconversion between different lipid species. And then the small GTPases, which are activated by uh, GEFs and GAPs. So there's a lot of communication and feedback between these two biochemical reactions. And we wanna to try to understand how that is achieved inside of cells. And we also use a biochemical approach to try to dissect the mechanism. So it's been appreciated for a long time that there is really tight spatial and temporal coupling between PIP lipids and small GTPases. Uh, I apologize if you're red, green, colorblind. These are papers from about 15 years ago. But what you're seeing here is a biosensor for RAS at the leading edge of dictostelium, and then a PIP3 sensor. And what's been shown in these cells is if you disrupt either one of those uh, signaling pathways, you, you kind of break down the ability to effectively polarize and migrate. Uh, 
So thinking about other properties of small GTPases and PIP lipids, uh, you know, oftentimes as cell biologists, we we lay a, a sledgehammer down on cells and we we get them into these hyperactivated states. And the reality is like a lot of these signaling pathways are very transient. So this is an example from dictostelium where the cells are stimulated and you get this transient response where, where PIP3 is created at the, the plasma membrane, but then it's rapidly dephosphorylated. The way that I think about the cell biological systems is that there's generally global inhibitors that are keeping these systems off. And there needs to be then some input that pushes the system above that global inhibitor. And then if there are positive and negative feedback loops, the system could maybe uh, run away and go into a new steady state condition. Uh, in some cases, the cells may maintain a high level of these PIP lipids. In other cases, it may be that the input is not strong enough and then the, the signal returns back to a baseline. Both of these mechanisms are really critical. So you could imagine being able to return to baseline is critical for homeostasis and the and signal adaptation, but then being able to move into a new steady state condition could be critical for cellular differentiation. The other emergent properties that we're interested in are how do, how do PIP lipids become asymmetrically distributed across the plasma membrane? And then how do they uh, organize into cortical oscillations, which have a periodicity that sweeps across the membrane on a 20 second time scale? So in thinking about the mechanisms that control these spatial patterning systems, uh, I wanna draw your attention to this, this paper that was published uh, over a decade ago, where researchers that were studying dictostelium in one of these circuits that's a, is a re really important for cell polarity, they showed that if you depolymerize the actin cytoskeleton, this PIP lipid oscillator can persist in the cell in the absence of actin filaments. So that suggests that there's some intrinsic organizing mechanism that allows these proteins to form these networks that propagate across the plasma membrane in the absence of the actin cytoskeleton. So some of the questions that we're trying to answer is what's setting the frequency and amplitude of these oscillations? Can we modulate the behavior of these oscillations and see what effect it has on cellular behavior? Uh, and then as a biochemist, we wanna to try to understand what are the minimal components and try to reconstitute pathways like this. Now, if we think about how this connects to uh, synthetic biology and building the cell, one of the features of being able to build a cell would be creating polarizable signaling networks that, that allow molecules to become polarized across the GUV, for example. So that's something that we're working towards. So I'm gonna tell you two brief stories I'm going to gloss over some of the details and, and just really try to give you a flavor of how we approach these problems. Uh, the first is thinking about enzymology. How do we dissect the mechanism of PIP lipid modifying enzymes using single molecule biophysics? And then how do we go about trying to understand the communication between PIP lipids and small GTPases using both biochemistry and cell biology? Okay, so... The, the biochemical reactions we're going to look at today are the conversion of PIP2 to PIP3. And, and this is controlled by PI3 kinase. So there's four paralogs in most of our cells. And all of these enzymes are auto inhibited and they require combinations of signaling inputs to become activated. And then once PIP3 is created, it doesn't stay around for very long. So within tens of seconds, it's dephosphorylated at the plasma membrane. And that's achieved either by P10, which converts it back to PIP2, or SHIP1, which dephosphorylates it to a different lipid species called PI34. So we're gonna talk about how SHIP1 is regulated. Okay, so the first project is uh, trying to understand how PI3 kinase beta is activated. And, and this is work that Naomi Wilson and Benjamin uh, Dewell in my lab has been working on for the last couple of years. So we're close to submitting this for review. So we chose PI3 kinase beta because it is the only paralog that integrates information from RAC1 or CDC42. And if, if you're familiar with those molecules or you're not, uh, those are two GGPases that interface uh, with actin nucleation promoting factors. So 
If we want to eventually be able to reconstitute polarization via PIP3 and actin assembly, we want to probably use this as the, the signaling pathway. So this is a kind of a complicated landscape of molecular interactions where PI3 kinase beta can interact with three different signaling inputs. And what's unclear from the literature is how does it prioritize these interactions? And which, which of the interactions just localize PI3 kinase to the membrane and which ones actually modulate its catalytic activity? And what I'll, what I'll try to show you is that there does seem to be some uh, switches in activity where certain uh, factors kick this enzyme into high gear and, and allow it to uh, phosphorylate lipids at a much higher, at much faster rate. So the biochemical approach that we're taking is primarily using supported lipid bilayers to visualize single molecule binding events and uh, uh, quantify the biophysical properties of these enzymes. So we can deposit uh, lipids onto a glass support of a defined composition, trying to mimic the, the behavior of the plasma membrane. We can then flow a uh, fluorescent labeled PI3 kinase over these membranes and monitor their dynamics. So on top of being able to see the kinases, we can also simultaneously measure the production of PIP lipids. We can look at the activation of GTPases and then we can also visualize various sensors. Basically, whatever we conjugate to the membrane, we can see it. So this is a cartoon schematic just showing the setup for our reconstitution. So we've developed ways where we can covalently attach each of these three signaling inputs. Uh, so we have a phosphorylated peptide that is derived from the platelet-derived growth factor receptor. We have RAC1, which we can activate using uh, various methods, either chemical activation or we can flow in a GEF. And then we have farnesylated G beta gamma that we've purified from insect cells. And to the right here, you can see some fluorescent images just showing that we can detect the localization of these proteins using fluorescent biosensors. So we have a, an, an SH2 domain that can bind to these phosphorylated peptides. And then we have a, a RAC1 GTP sensor that primarily recognizes the GTP state. And then the G beta gamma is fluorescently labeled. So we can equilibrate that into the membrane at different densities. So the first experiment we did was just vary the density of these signaling inputs, and then look at what controls the localization of PI3 kinase beta. And what you can see is on this top panel, we're, we're using a very low concentration of PI3 kinase where we can resolve single molecules. And only in the presence of PY peptide do we get robust recruitment of, of PI3 kinase. This bottom panel is, is just showing a much higher concentration. So we're increasing it 2000 fold. And now you can see that you can no longer resolve single molecules. You just get a blanket of fluorescence. We can monitor the kinetics of membrane absorption. So this is looking at PI3 kinase binding to the membrane. You can see only in the P presence of PY do you get robust membrane recruitment. Okay, so now this is where I'm gonna skip over a lot of details and, and just kind of get straight to the mechanism. Basically what we find is that the PY peptide is able to recruit PI3 kinase to the membrane, but this results in pretty slow uh, catalysis. Now the enzyme is no longer auto inhibited. It's, it's, it's known that these SH2 domains, which are these blue, mo these blue blobs attached to PI3 kinase beta, beta are what bind to the PY peptide. Now, once, it's, once PI3 kinase gets to the membrane, now it can engage either uh, G beta gamma or RAC1, and that results in much faster kinetics. So what we think is happening is, is that G beta gamma and RAC1 are orienting PI3 kinase so that its active site is in a position so that it can catalyze reactions more efficiently. Now, there's also a lot of conformational changes that happen in PI3 kinase that are that we're unable to see in these assays, but people like John Burke have been using a hydrogen deuterium ion exchange mass spec to look at those conformational changes. And we've been collaborating with him. Uh, we've, we've published a variety of papers recently looking at 
the structural biology of PI3 kinase and how it engages different signaling molecules on membranes. I think in the future, you're going to see more papers coming out where people uh, reconstitute these molecular interactions on either lipid nanodisks or on vesicles and then use cryo-EM to look at the structures. And it appears that, that there's going to be an ensemble of structures that uh, are that these enzymes can access. And I think one of the goals moving forward is combining those structural biology approaches with approaches like single molecule uh, FRET to try to look at the conformational dynamics at a really high temporal resolution to try to relate these different conformational states to different catalytic uh, states that the enzyme can be in. Okay, so what do we wanna do eventually? So th this knowledge that we have, this is just one, one part of a big puzzle. So understanding PI3 kinase regulation is important to us because we all ultimately want to be able to reconstitute complex feedback circuits and I just want to draw up one type of feedback circuit that we're interested in, which is in neutrophils, for example, um, we think that PI3 kinase is associated with the membrane, uh, constitutively with phosphorylated peptides, but then when a G protein coupled receptor gets activated, uh, G beta gamma stimulates PI3 kinase, that creates some PIP3, PIP3 and then PIP3 can uh, recruit proteins like PREX, which is a GEF, and that then stimulates the activation of small GTPases. So you can create a feed forward loop that then amplifies PIP3 production. Now, one of the things about cell polarity is that the system cannot just get locked into this state of feedback. There also needs to be negative inhibition. And that's really critical in order for a cell to uh, adapt to new concentrations of signaling molecules that it's receiving in its environment. And also the, the, the cell needs to be able to recycle these components. If, if all these components get locked in in one area at the plasma membrane, they're not going to be able to be redistributed to new areas, which is uh, critical for being able to reorient and polarize in new directions. So we're also thinking about how GTPase activating proteins, which actually inactivate uh, GGPases uh, play a role in shutting these signal down, and then also what role phosphatases uh, play in shutting these signals off. So we haven't we haven't gotten to the point where we can reconstitute complex circuits like this. I think there's still too many unknowns, but just to give you a flavor of what is possible, uh, this is some work that I did as a postdoc in Jay Grove's lab at UC Berkeley, and. What I did was I, I, I developed a reconstitution that was composed of two lipids, so uh, PI4P and PIP2, and a kinase and phosphatase that drive the interconversion between both of these lipid species. Now, the thing about this reconstitution is that both of the enzymes have positive feedback loop based on product recognition, which is that as PI5 kinase creates PIP2, if there's PIP2 on the membrane, it's going to enhance its localization because it's able to bind to PIP2 through another binding site. And that's going to result in it creating more PIP2 in that area, and you're going to get local amplification. Similarly, the phosphatase in some cases can have that property. So what happens with this just simple two-component system is that when you flow these enzymes over a supported lipid bilayer that starts homogeneous, and it has uh, an equal concentration of both uh, PIP4 and, and PIP5. And I also want to note that the total concentration of these PIP lipids in these membranes is only 4 molar percent. So this is a dilute uh, system where not the entire, the entire membrane is not PIP lipids. But you get the following result. So when you flow these enzymes in, the system immediately breaks symmetry. And that's because you have stochastic membrane association of the kinase and phosphatase. And you start to get heterogeneity in the membrane composition. Eventually, you create zones that have exclusively PIP2 or exclusively uh, PI4P. So we think that we can reconstitute more complex circuits that have similar emergent properties or able to create traveling waves that can drive uh, polarization of other signaling molecules, like for example, the actin cytoskeleton.
Um, we recently published a paper looking at the mechanism of PI5 kinase. So I'm kind of taking a tangent here just to highlight the complexity of the signaling molecule that allowed us to reconstitute this, this reaction diffusion system. So the enzyme exists as a monomer in solution. It associates with the membrane. It can bind cooperatively to PIP2. So you can see that going from 1% to 4% PIP2, there's a 25-fold increase in its dwell time. So there's that positive feedback based on product recognition. And then the kinase can also dimerize. And that leads to its activity being potentiated. Uh, and it starts creating more PIP2 lipids. So there's some more work that we're doing trying to dissect this mechanism and try to understand uh, how this is orchestrated in pathways like phagocytosis, which is where we think it, it this property uh, primarily exists. Okay, I'm gonna take a minute. Does anybody have any questions about anything I just mentioned? There's quite a bit of questions in the chat. Um, I don't know, can you see the chat? Oh, oh excellent. Okay. Uh, can this PIP, li pip, pip lipid modification be done in vitro and liposomes? In liposomes, um, yes. One thing that we've done, so yes, you can do it on liposomes. We've also used lipid coated glass beads. Um, we've tried doing this on, on GUVs, but the electro -for formation process uh, makes it really hard to get negatively charged lipids in, for example, PIP2. And we found that we had to, I mean, to, to achieve the same PIP lipid density that we get on a support lipid bilayer in a GUV, you end up having to use five to 10 times more to kind of compensate for the challenges of getting it in. And we haven't been able to get the polarization reaction to work on a GUV yet, but we also haven't put a ton of effort into it. Um, can you reconstitute G protein mediated pathways in vitro using liposomes? Um, it, so when we think about G proteins, I'll focus on small GTPases. Yes, there's lots of ways to um, activate small GTPases on liposomes. You can either covalently link them or you can just let them partition into the membranes using their farnesylated uh, lipid anchors. Does the nature of lipids affect the pathway um, in the mixture? So we, we definitely use simplified lipid compositions. So we're primarily using something like 95% DOPC or DOPE. And then we have, in terms of functional lipids, like maleamide, which is what we conjugate lipids or our proteins to, we have 2%. And then for the PIP lipids, we have 2 to 4%. The reason we keep things simple is one, uh, we're we try to reduce the complexity so we can actually measure protein interactions or lipid interactions and be able to interpret it. Uh, the second thing is it's expensive to buy, you know, five or six different lipids and mix them together. And we've also shown that it doesn't matter if it's a complicated lipid composition. Uh, a lot of these pathways, the interactions are driven by protein interactions, not lipid interactions. So we try to make that kind of the, the center piece instead of, you know, adding cholesterol and sphingomyelin and, and all this other, um, all these other components that don't seem to have any effect. Now, one of the questions we get a lot is, you know, what happens if we add cholesterol and start to um, create nano domains or, or um, uh, lipid rafts? Cholesterol in general is not something that I recommend adding to support lipid bilayers. It can result in a lot of defects, which can make the reconstitutions a lot more sloppy, where you have lots of nonspecific binding. Um, and it doesn't really change the fluidity that much, at least in, in our hands. OK. If I didn't answer your question, um, we, I'm happy to come back to that in a minute uh, at the end here. OK. so. We're going to transition a little bit and we're going to we're going to talk about okay once you have pip3 created what is dephosphorylating this lipid and it, it's, it's a cell cell type specific problem we're going to we're going to talk about 
the role that SHIP1 plays in immune cells. Okay, so what is SHIP1 and why do we care? So SHIP1 caught our eye because it's been shown to regulate neutrophil chemotaxis. So there's a couple of papers. Uh, 15 years ago, researchers developed a mouse knockout um, that allowed them to determine that SHIP1 is critical for migration. So all these little jagged lines are the paths that uh, neutrophil is taking in the presence of a chemotractant. And then Sean Collins did um, an RNAi screen in human neutrophils using a photo uncageable chemotractant and also showed that SHIP1 was critical for neutrophil cell migration. So we approached this problem, uh, you know, returning and trying to establish that we can see the phenotype. Um, what we did was establish CRISPR interference inside of neutrophils to silence SHIP1 expression. And I just want to show you the phenotype here. So here are wild type cells on the left. You can see they're, they're kind of jiggling around. And then what happens here is they're stimulated with a bacterial peptide and they start to polarize and, and move forward. When you look at uh, a SHIP1 knockdown, you can see these cells are massive. They, they're hyper protrusive. Their overall footprint in some cases is two to three times larger than the, the wild type cells. So the reason these cells have this hyperprotrusive morphology is that they have an elevated level of PIP3, and that's causing the actin cytoskeleton to be nucleated across the whole plasma membrane. So these cells have a hard time migrating because they really can't decide which direction they wanna move. So this intrigued us. We wanted to try to understand the mechanism by which SHIP1 is regulated. And we started by taking a biochemical approach. Uh, so this is the overall architecture of SHIP1 where it has an SH2 domain. This is a motif that interacts with phosphorylated tyrosines, which is found in a lot of uh, receptors. It has a catalytic domain, and then it, there's several reported PIP lipid binding or PIP lipid binding motifs. In the C-terminus, there is an intrinsically disordered domain that has uh, a variety of proline-rich motifs, which are predicted to interact with SH3 binding domains. So we wanted to biochemically characterize receptor activation, define lipid interactions. Ultimately, we want to understand what proteins SHIP1 is scaffolding. Uh, just to kind of tell you what we've learned, um, there's a lot of, or there's, there's several papers that uh, suggest SHIP1 is able to interact with both its substrate and its product using these peripheral lipid binding motifs. And, and what we've seen through biochemical analysis is that SHIP1 has an extremely weak affinity for lipids. And the primary mechanism for getting it to a membrane is through protein interactions. So we have a manuscript in review where we've shown that SHIP1 is auto inhibited through this SH2 domain. If you present a phosphorylated peptide to SHIP1, or yeah, it can, it can get recruited to the plasma membrane and that results in its activity being stimulated. Okay, so to get a better idea of how SHIP1 is regulated, we also have been doing complementary cell biology experiments. So we're using these PLB-like uh, cells, which, um, these are a cancer-derived leukemia cell line, which have a neutrophil-like state. And what Sean Collins' lab has beautifully shown is if you differentiate them and compare their gene expression profiles to primary human neutrophils, they're, they're very similar. Once these cells are differentiated, you can add formulated peptides, and they will chemotax towards those peptides. So the first thing we did was uh, use lentivirus to express SHIP1 phosphatase in these cells. And this is looking at the localization of SHIP1 in a human neutrophil. So you can see that as the cell pushes the membrane forward, you get an enrichment of SHIP1. But then you can also see within the cell body, there's these oscillations in SHIP1 localization. So we can look at this. In a, in a more static cell that's just resting and is attached to fibronectin. And you can see that SHIP1 oscillates across the plasma membrane. Uh, 
And this graph here is just showing the change in fluorescence at a particular position. You can also see that there's some heterogeneity in this signal. So they're little punctate structures and, and we don't totally know what that localization is, but we hypothesize it is uh, clathrin coated pits or ship ones being internalized through this fast endophil and mediate endocytosis. So we're trying to look at the co-localization with some other endocytic markers to try to understand that. And, and you can see that better in other cells where the SHIP-1 expression is a little bit lower. But we're fascinated with these oscillations and, and these oscillations have been seen in other cell types. So Min Wu, who is a researcher at uh, over the Mechanical Biology Institute in Singapore and Peter Debriotis at John Hopkins has done a lot of work characterizing what's referred to as the excitable signaling network. So this is a network of proteins and uh, lipids that is able to self-organize on the plasma membrane. Right here, you're looking at one of the modules, which is the membrane deformation module. This is FPP17, which is a membrane curvature sensing protein. And basically what's happening is that GTPases and PIP lipids are a signaling cue that recruits um, FBP17 and actin cytoskeletal regulators like NWASP to the membrane. You have actin assembly. This is then turned over and you get some cyclical oscillations. I'll try to briefly describe what we think is happening here by breaking down each of these modules. So if we think about what is composing this self-organizing unit, you have the biochemical reactions. So here we are with the lipids and the small GTPases that surely have communication. So you can think of this as a reaction diffusion system where you have a lipid or a GTPase that's created and then that can diffuse laterally across the membrane to propagate signal. This is then a signaling cue for these membrane deformation or uh, curvature sensing proteins like FPP17, which has this F bar. Um, how the membrane curvature is created initially is not really clear. Uh, I mean, there, there is some research that has shown that just simply increasing protein density at the, the membrane can cause curvature to be created. Uh, also, these F-bar proteins interact with PIP lipids, so they could arrive and create curvature. Uh, thinking about the role of the actin cytoskeleton, the actin cytoskeleton plays both a positive and negative role. The, the positive role, you could imagine, is uh, actin network could spatially confine reactions and allow them to become locally amplified so that you can cross barriers of inhibition and get into highly active regimes that allow signal to be propagated to other components. But then the actin cytoskeleton is also thought to be a negative regulator. Uh, what you're looking at here is a chymograph, which was drawn through a cell. And I'll try draw your attention to how FBP17 in green arrives in the membrane. And then over time, you see the actin cytoskeleton um, is built and FBP17 goes away. I think the, the model that I think best explains what's happening is that the actin cytoskeleton is going to deform the membrane and it's going to make the membrane topography incompatible with uh, the FBP17 binding. And this is probably the major mechanism that's driving this fast oscillation through the cell is, is this cycle of membrane deformation. And Min Wu's lab is very beautifully shown using methods like reflective interference contrast that there is actually membrane deformation on the plasma membrane that propagates in a wave-like pattern. And you can modulate the behavior of this system by just changing things like osmolarity. So coming back to SHIP-1, we were trying to understand what controls the localization of SHIP-1. And we've made some mutants. Um, one of the mutants is deleting the C-terminal fragment. And what we see when we delete the C-terminus is that SHIP-1 becomes uniformly distributed across the membrane. It can no longer oscillate. And then we can also just express the C-terminal fragment. And that is sufficient to see uh, this oscillatory localization pattern. Now, it's not that the C-terminus alone can organize this oscillation, but 
you should think of the C terminus as a license for partitioning into the excitable network or these cortical oscillations. So we've been able to narrow down this motif to about a 10 amino acid sequence, which is cool. And this is one of the beauties of doing biochemistry and cell biology is that as we start dissecting the function of these proteins, we identify motifs that have particular properties that can be repurposed for synthetic biology. So for example, now you could attach that motif to your protein of interest and partition it into the excitable network. And maybe it's able to modulate the properties of those cortical oscillations. So thinking about what's controlling the localization of SHIP-1, um, we don't totally know. We've been taking a candidate approach and this is largely based off of what other people have seen. So if, if we co-express this F-bar containing protein with SHIP-1, we can see clear co-localization. And FEV17 does have an SH3 domain, which can potentially interact with SHIP-1. Um, this is just looking at the oscillations where it seems like FEP17 and SHIP1 do arrive at the same time, but then SHIP1 localization persists a bit longer. Thinking what's, what's upstream of FEP17, well, FEP17 has been shown to interact with CDC42, and CDC42 can also oscillate across the, the membrane of these cells. Um, CDC42 is a really challenging protein to delete from neutrophils because it's so critical, but there is a there is a drug that inhibits its activity. And if we add that to these cells, it shuts down the oscillations. So one potential model that describes how SHIP1 is being regulated is that it's recruited. Well, first the upstream signal will be CDC42, which recruits this F-bar containing protein, which recruits SHIP1, and then that would dephosphorylate the PIP lipids. The interesting thing is that this oscillating uh, system seems to be sweeping across the membrane independent of whether PIP3 is created. So it's kind of, you can think of it as just a surveillance mechanism um, that is in a prime state to just rapidly dephosphorylate PIP3 whenever it's created. It's also probably playing an important role in endocytosis of uh, receptors. Okay, so just, just to summarize what, what I showed you with SHIP-1 regulation, um, SHIP-1 localizes to the leading edge membrane of a polarized neutrophil and exhibits cortical oscillations, which we think are uh, part of this excitable signaling network composed of the actin cytoskeleton and, and F-bar F containing proteins, PIP lipids, and small GTPases. So with that, I, I wanna thank my lab. Um, my lab's composed of graduate students and undergrads and uh, various collaborators. So uh, Peter Beeling is over at the Max Planck Institute in Dortmund. And we do a lot of, we share a lot of tools for the biochemistry. Uh, Jerry Hammond is a cell biologist. And we have a, we're, we're thinking a lot about PIP lipid homeostasis and the mechanisms that control that through these PIP lipid modifying enzymes. Sean Collins has provided a lot of resources for us to become better cell biologists and geneticists. And then John Burke, we work with, with him on the structural biology of PI3 kinase. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, there is a few more questions in chat. Okay. If we can hear. Um, this is really interesting. Okay, so are, how close are we to be able to reconstitute chemotaxis? So I think that we don't know as much about actin myosin as we like to think. And, you know, we, we need to be able, it's, it's one thing to be able to create a, a polarized front, but you also need to have a polarized back that's like contractile that can help push uh, a, 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 you know, an artificial cell forward. So I think that that's gonna be the new frontier. Uh, there's a lot of really good biochemistry happening on that front. I do think we're close to be able to just creating synthetic cells that can polarize, but 
I don't think we're going to be able to do it so simply with just filling a GUV with a set of reactions that can break symmetry and, and polarize in the way that we see in neutrophils. I know like work from uh, Pietra Shvili using the min oscillator that that I think that some of the bacterial systems are probably closer to reconstituting in that sense. Um, some of the tools that we're working on uh, that I wasn't able to present is we're using optogenetics to spatially control where signaling molecules are activated on membranes. So you could imagine encapsulating a reaction mixture that is globally inhibited and then using optogenetics to trigger a reaction on one side of a GOV. And then that would get amplified and allow the system to polarize on one front of that vesicle. So I think that would, I think that's possible. Obviously there's a lot of technical challenges in terms of encapsulation and getting all the proteins to be happy, but I like that approach more. Um, a lot of interest in access. Would you speculate if you could use a network to engineer? Yes. So can we can we use these types of systems in combination with actin cytoskeleton to, to form membranes? Certainly, um, there are proteins in the Ezrin, uh, Moesian, and Redixin family, for example, that are able to bridge interactions between PIP lipids and the actin cytoskeleton. Uh, that's something that we haven't really included in any of these reconstitutions. I think the next phase of this project is, you know, we, we have some simple systems that can polarize PIP lipids and we want to start engineering um, communication between the PIP lipids, small GTPases, and the actin cytoskeleton. Um, what is the most complex you have ever studied most proteins and different lipids? The most complex system that I've studied in this realm was when I was in Dyke Mullen's lab, I would use lipid coated glass beads to reconstitute actin assembly. And we had six proteins present. That is extremely difficult because you need to make, just to be able to get every protein behaving the way that you expect, uh, there's just there's so much parameter space when you when you have to find the sweet spot for for six different proteins that it, it becomes hard to be reproducible. So the system I showed you earlier that the yellow and blue uh, reaction infusion system that broke symmetry that's only two enzymes. The biosensors I don't really include because they aren't really they don't really perturb the system in any way. They're just kind of pedestrians that are playing a passive role in highlighting the localization of lipids. And then even with PI3 kinase, I think we can get down to two proteins um, where you can we can we can design molecules in a way where we we kind of chop off a lot of the complex regulation so that you have minimal minimal components that that have really complex properties. That's all the questions any, that we had. Yeah, if anyone wants to unmute themselves and jump in, you're welcome. Yeah, we get most questions by chat in this semester. That's cool. For some reason. So I think I'm going to be attending that synthetic biology conference that you sent a call out for Kate. So if anybody wants to talk to me there, that's going to be in a couple months, I think. Uh, I'd be happy. It would be great to meet people. That'll be great. That'll be great to see you. Um, and, and then I also usually attend ASCB, and then I'm going to the American Society for Molecular Biology and Biochemistry up in Seattle next month. Great. So please, please reach out if you have any questions. Cool. And thank you so much. And thanks, everyone. Thanks for the questions. And thank you, Scott, again for a um, fascinating talk. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. And see you. Bye. Bye.